All right, everyone. Either you've made it through two very long episodes <laughs> covering the <laughs> the first two thirds of our Judas Priest ranking, or uh, you've just decided to jump in to hear what the top six are, which I which I think makes sense. If you're if you're not a huge fan, maybe you just want to hear what we think is the best. And so, welcome. Um, but if you are uh, uh, one of the troopers um, that uh, that made it through two whole episodes until now, um, you are the uh, chosen ones. You are the special ones, the beautiful ones, um, the beautiful people, the beautiful people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, oh, I didn't even say welcome to crank and cranked and ranked. Oh my god! Okay, <laughs> that's not one of my better intros, but. Um, I, with with these, I think just just don't fuck around. We'll just get right into it. Today we are uh, at the end of our Judas Priest ranking. We are going to be doing our top six of our rankings. So if you're just joining us for the first time here, um, we uh, did all 18 full length studio albums from uh, Judas Priest, ranking from our least favorite. Now we're getting to our most favorite, and uh, between the two of us. Mr. Eddie Sparks, say hello, Eddie. What's up? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> hey. I, I didn't know where that was going. Um, it, it was, <laughs> that was some lowness. Um, uh, <laughs> Eddie is is more of a Judas Priest fan, and um, and he's had more time with these albums, even though he is a younger lad, as they say in your country, lads. Um, yep. <laughs> and, uh, I am, am 20 years older than him, but I've never been into Judas Priest aside from random songs. So I took it upon myself to jump in and do the full ride, starting with the first album all the way to the most recent album. And I did my rankings based on how I felt, felt and felt about the albums and how they went from one to the next one and the quality of the songs and all of those things. I didn't really... I didn't go and read about the history of things and I didn't read reviews. Um, so I, uh, I feel like I tried to be as pure as I could with my experience with this music. And, um, and that's coming from a guy who considers himself a metal fan, but, um, I'm, ass I'm assuming there are, are a good amount of people out there that would think that if I'm not a Judas priest fan, then maybe I'm not a proper metal fan anyway, <laughs> but that's fine. I don't care. <laughs> but um, so, yeah, so we are down to number six through number one. And without further ado, Eddie, do you have anything to add before we jump in? Uh, I, I just wanted to say there's a running gag on uh, Metal Up Your Podcast that that just made me think of. Every time they get something like remotely wrong, they'll like play the... Uh, what is it? It's, it's like a siren. It's the metal police. And it's just, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I yeah. had I had a comment from somebody saying that they couldn't take me seriously because I confessed to being a Limp Biscuit fan. And uh, re I mean, really, if that's the, if that's the 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 uh, narrow world you want to live in, then please enjoy yourself. But I am uh, my eyes are wide fucking open, man. Um, so anyway, <laughs> that there's a felony charge in these parts. <laughs> um, shit. Anyway. Yeah. Let's just go ahead and jump right into it. As usual, I'm going to let Eddie go first and, uh, start off with his number six in the final episode of Judas priest, 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 priest. priest. It was priest. supposed to be like a, <laughs> like a decaying echo, but I wasn't backing up from the microphone. So it was just, <laughs> it was like a skipping record. All right, go ahead. <laughs> cool um oh, great start voice crack right off the bat <laughs> i am not editing that out that was too good <laughs> that is staying in. <clears throat> cool um yeah so for my number six i've gone for the latest installment in their discography which is 2018's firepower yeah um so yeah it's it's the most recent and it just goes to show Judas Priest are one of those bands that, you know, barring, a, a, you know, glam metal direction in the mid 80s, they've pretty much gotten heavier and heavier throughout their career to some variable extent. Uh, and, you know, this to me 
in my opinion, could be their strongest album since Painkiller. And I'm I, I think go... I feel like there are a lot of people that would agree with that. Yeah, it's it's if it's very much like how I felt about Hardwired by Metallica. It gives off that same holy shit, these guys are they're actually back, you know, kind of feel to it. And, you know, they've been they've been making great music for a long time. But um this of all of their like modern day stuff, thankfully their most recent to me is their most impressive. So uh without further ado, let's do my track by track. Do we so, do, do we ever use the word ado unless we're talking about having no further of it? Did I say no further ado? You did. The, I, you did say no no further ado, but that's a ado is a word that I don't ever use unless I use it in that phrase. <laughs> yeah, actually, now that you <laughs> We should do a podcast which is nothing but ado. <laughs> I'm sorry to interrupt just, you. <laughs> no, that's cool. No, it's just we should do an entire podcast dedicated to just picking apart like paragraphs of people's like <laughs> fucking comments on these videos. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, I just I, that just popped into my head, and I've just gotten used to saying <laughs> what I think, which I guess might get me in trouble. But you know, all right, go ahead. Firepower. I might have to get the metal police back again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, track one, firepower straight up heavy track that just feels fucking great really really feels like something that could have easily been on painkiller and uh, judas priest really benefits from the beefy production presented here um which is followed up by lightning strike i'm actually as far as modern production goes i feel like it really fits judas priest and you know they sound great here, and considering their age, they're still putting out excellent heavy metal music. And, you know, Evil Never Dies, you know, it's not letting up. Uh, it's a gnarly fucking song, really groovy and heavy. Never the Heroes feels like a modern take on a powerful 80s metal track. Um, Necromancer, awesome borderline thrash song. Uh, Children of the Sun. Oh, oh, that's one of our Children of the songs. We can add that to a list of songs we mentioned yeah. a few episodes back. You know, Children of the Sea, Children of the Grave. Children Chil of the Damned! The damned. <laughs> oh, that was pretty good. I'm going to try out for Iron Maiden next. <laughs> <laughs> there has got to be a, there's got to be so many songs, though, out there called Children of the Something. Probably. God bless the children of the beast. Oh, hey. Motley yes. Crew. Yes. Yeah. Holy top top shit. 10 That's... children of the songs next episode. <laughs> <laughs> We've got to do that. It's like an April Fool's special or something. <laughs> that would be fucking great. <laughs> okay. Uh, where was I at? I was, I was at Children of the Sun. Mm -hmm. It's a heavy plotter. Real cool. Uh, Guardians is like this really pretty interlude. You know, it feels like something out of a movie and it leads directly into rising from ruins. Something that I love is that despite the modern production, Judas Priest aren't afraid to do what they do best. It's just classic heavy metal. It's got echoes of the 80s and that snare gets the Eddie Sparks gated reverb seal of <laughs> approval. Mwah. Too many bands forget how important a snare is in setting the tone and space in which music sits. And they even have a little synth on this too. So this was definitely a little bit of a an homage to their older days, but yeah. it still manages to feel extremely, you know, up to date and relevant. I do feel and like a lot, especially the production on this album, I feel like we're coming out of an era where people have forgotten about what was great about... 70s and 80s production because I, I see that even though there's modern production elements on an album like this it doesn't it it doesn't have that same lifeless feeling that a lot of other things do so I feel like there's certain producers I think Andy Sneap was involved in this one yeah um, e either as a mixer or something but Andy Sneap is a 
he the stuff he works on i think when it comes to modern production i think it, it sounds pretty damn good he's done a lot i think he did the last testament album um he's done oh, a, shit. He, yeah. he, he's done a lot of uh, shit and he uh he was also in uh he was in a a, a big um english thrash metal band um, which band was he in? Holy fuck! I'm gonna get crucified by by people for not knowing. Oh, was, oh, he was in he was in Sabbath. <laughs> oh shit! Yeah, he was in Sabbath, and now he's a producer. And uh, well, I guess Sabbath. I don't. I guess Sabbath's not going anymore. Fuck, I don't know. I I wasn't really into them that much, but um, he was he was in that band, and now he's a pretty damn good producer. Sorry, that was a that was kind of related, but um, I, I was really just making the the connection that I hope that the the uh, the, I don't know, the, the, the light at the end of the tunnel with production. I think we're seeing it. I yeah. hope that it's going to be, we'll find that nice middle ground with using technology in the ways that it really helps us and makes things easier. But at the same time, not forgetting how good a big old room sounds, you know, in a, yeah. in a production. So, uh, Sorry, you were on. You were on rising from ruins. <laughs> oh no, that's pretty much all I had for it. I was just. I just wanted to say how it really does feel like we are coming full circle with production because a lot of the bands that would play an older style of metal at like it maybe even at like right at the first part of the previous decade. You're talking like 2010, late 2000s, and into the early 2010s. Everyone was like playing old styles but with modern production and now people are beginning to find out actually the old production kind of served that music yeah. a little bit better yeah so it's like you now, can have, you can have that real modern shit if you're doing tech death or something that's that's yeah. fine that seems appropriate but um yeah this kind of music needs a little more room and so something that gave me a little bit of hope uh, last year, I found just before I get back on track with uh, Judas Priest, there's a, I don't know which country they're from, but there's a modern 80s hard rock slash glam metal band called Crazy Licks, spelt with... <laughs> I think I've heard of them. Uh, spelt with L-I-X-X, -X, and it's honestly one of the closest productions i've heard in recent times and it came out last year i think i don't know what the album's called i think it's like breakout or something i'll i'll find out but i feel like they're swedish i don't know why that's that's the yeah. thing that i'm is in my brain i'm probably wrong but so instead of being wrong i'm not going to say anything anymore <laughs> <laughs> but yeah the production on on that feels like a slightly clearer and punchier version of exactly what um glam metal album sounded like in like the late 80s and early no early early 90s sorry <laughs> and you know i'm really excited to see where like you know the next 10 years of production goes whether it goes in a more organic direction or you know i hope it does i yeah. hope it goes in that kind of old school kind of uh production even if it is like simulators and stuff it'll still be really cool yeah i don't care how they get the sound as long as it sound it doesn't Sounds as long good. as it doesn't sound mechanical or you know yeah. like created on a laptop kind of shit um then i'm fine with it i don't care how they do it i just like the sound of it exactly yeah and uh now that we've uh, made our opinions clear on the production of yes of the modern day i better get back to the track by track again before we get to tangent city <laughs> yeah yeah you're, you're about to get to one of my favorites on the album yeah flamethrower is fucking awesome yeah i really i, love... I really like the in the chorus the way his voice goes up with the guitar the flamethrower like that thing yeah I, every time i hear that i go oh that's really cool i like that yeah it's in you know that they're still doing things to this day that feels fresh you know that there are moments on here that I think, have I heard them do that before? Because that was fucking cool. And that's what I got from that chorus. Do you think uh, it has anything to do with Richie Faulkner? Do you think he brings anything, like a, like a new energy to the band? I feel like, you know, definitely having some, you know, obviously he's, I think he's in his 40s while the rest of the band are, you know, approaching, if not, 
in their 70s. So, you know, Richie Faulkner... Oh, you're right. Shit. I didn't even think about that, dude. They're... <laughs> well, I, th- I think Richie Faulkner is the same age as British Steel. <laughs> like, when you think they were six albums in and he would join a band that's 10 years older than him. Well, more than that, yeah. Jesus. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They'd been around for like 12 years before he was even born, and now he's in the band. Yeah, hey, that's pretty cool. It is cool, you know? I I, I really like what, um you know, they do on this album, you know? Spectre is, is pure groove. Uh, Traitor's Gate, painkiller, very painkiller era feel. I'm really impressed with this album in case you couldn't tell <laughs> but um yeah no surrender ah oh, this one this one got a real you know fist in the air thing from me because i was just thinking the whole time you know it reminds me a little bit of dokken in the guitar work and kind of tone choices and it even has like following the um following the solo it has that awesome thing that i love the eighties bands did where they would have the chorus, but they would have nothing behind it, but just the, um, like in the drums, it would just be on the floor toms. I fucking love stuff like that. Just those little inflections in there that let you know, this is awesome. Yeah. And I know (laughs) it's fucking awesome. That's when everybody claps their hands above their heads in the crowd. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> exactly yeah I, I just love how like it, that that kind of songwriting technique is built to work a stadium yeah and, and that that's what i always view judas priest as is is this arena act um oh, well, which fuck, they yeah. are shit <laughs> of course they are yeah and um yeah then you get lone wolf um yeah tony called Tony Iommi called. He wants his fucking groove back. Oh, yeah. You know, this, like, there is a definite Sabbath feel to Lone Wolf. And then, finally, you get the this big, epic closing track, Sea of Red. And I'm going to be honest, as far as modern metal albums go, this record blew me away. You know, it really made me think, holy shit, you know, it, bands are starting to produce their records right again <laughs> yeah i mean when i talked about it it, it was an, an album that um i i would have i i think i would have put it higher up on its own merits you know just as an album like it's really it it was it was a surprising sort of uh closing to everything for me especially you know following no, Nostradamus and Redeemer of Souls, like Firepower to me was a great improvement over both of those. Um, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, it's, I mean, it, like I, I think I said this too, if this was the last album they did, I think that is a hell of a album to go out on, but I don't think, yeah. I don't think they're done. Oh yeah. Like if anything, you know, kind of touch wood on this one, but they, they've, they sound like they've got that hunger back. Yeah. And and they're they're you know ready to get out there and you know I know KK is not in the band anymore and you know Glenn Tipton has Parkinson's which really sucks yeah but um, you know they're still they can still write excellent heavy metal and uh, yeah even if they do lay it on a little thick sometimes in interviews where we're like we are metal gods you know yeah. it's, it's, <laughs> it's still it, it's like i'm not going to take that away from you because you are in and and that's the thing this is a great album yeah cool. so that's my number 6 All how right. much time we spent on number 6 wow 20 minutes well, we did wow. we did some tangents, but um, that doesn't always happen. But like like we've <laughs> like we've said many times, the these episodes are not so much about the order of the albums, but having discussions about them. Indeed. Um, and so that being said, when I now I'm going to jump into my number six. Now I told Eddie this before we started recording. I rearranged the order of these six two times um, because what I've been doing is. I, I created my list, and then before each episode, I go back and listen to all six of the albums I'm going to be talking about in the order that I ranked them to basically, you know, r- confirm, or like, oh, okay, did I fuck this up, or, you know, did I miss something <laughs> here, or whatever. 
And um, with with these albums, I went through and listened to them once and reordered them. And then I went back just to sort of like do a little touch touching here and there on certain songs. And I was like, oh, fuck, I don't know what I'm thinking. Shit, I'm going to rearrange this again. At the end, I had to go with my gut with yeah. how I feel about the music when it's playing and not so much... Uh, I don't know the the history of it all. Like where 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 did the album fall um, at the time? What was going on in music at the time? What had the band done before or after? I just had to go with these are the ones that I enjoyed the most. And to be honest, especially when we get up to the higher numbers here or the lower numbers, these are ones that um I I I think I'm gonna start looking for these on vinyl. Like I'd like to have them. So holy um, shit! But we'll but we'll start with my number six though. Um, my number six, after much uh, rearranging and rethinking, my number six is uh, the 1978 album Stained Class. Wow. Yeah. So you've got this one quite high up. I had I had Stained Class yeah. quite low. So yeah. the one thing that I've noticed is that um, go get yourself a pair of Beats headphones because really? um, they I could hear the bass in the album. Uh, now, when, I, when you listen to it just out of sort of regular speakers especially if you're using like computer speakers it's it's not there at all but um yeah. i was actually able to hear some bass and i go okay i kind of get it and and the bass isn't what the problem is with this album the overall production is very light like it really yeah. sounds like the the whoever was producing the album so let's see this was produced by Dennis McKay with Judas Priest i guess um, it's almost like he said, Hey, um, I got neighbors next door. So if you guys could kind of do the metal <laughs> thing real quiet, like turn your amps down and then we'll record this thing. Maybe like they were recording it in the middle of the night or something. Yeah. Um, cause it sounds that it sounds soft, but when I went back and listened to it again, I tried to imagine, okay, if this had a beefier sound, how would these songs sound? And imagine like Exc- Exciter is a fucking great song. And yeah. on its own, even with the production as it is. But if if they had cranked up the distortion and made the made it a little bit of a heavier production, that God, that's a that is a showstopper of a song. And you know, and then and even I mean even White White Heat Red Hot, fucking great song too. Like it's um the the thing that I like about this album is that um I feel like they hit something with Sin After Sin, which we'll get to. And and it's almost like they were riding the high off of making Sin After Sin. And Stay in Class feels like an album just kind of, kind of. there was a confidence. And they went, oh, okay, we we know what we're doing now. And this sort of just yeah. came, came right out of them. It's almost like, you know, I don't, I, I, I like to put like, I was thinking, this is a, I'm going to be a little bit crude here. Um, I was, <laughs> I was trying to, I was thinking in my head of analogies, listening to, Sin After Sin, Stay in Class, and Killing Machine. It's almost like um, Sin After Sin, they were young boys who were just figuring out that their dicks weren't just used for peeing. <laughs> like, like, oh, we've got, oh, we could do this. And then Stay in Class is them, like, getting really good at jerking off. <laughs> <laughs> like, they know, they've, they've now mastered that. And then Killing Machine is them, now they're fucking ladies. <laughs> now they're nice. out there and they're like, we know what to do with this. We're going to do it to you or men. If you're, <laughs> if you're uh, Rob, Rob if Hoffer, you're Rob. to each their own. <laughs> um, but it just feels like it's that sort of confidence, that young confidence of just like, fuck. Yeah. I know my direction in life now and staying yeah. class has that sort of young energy of we, we got this guys. And so um, it's not like a huge progression from sin after sin to me, but um, it's very strong. And, um, there are a couple weak, weaker tracks here. Um, honestly, the one I think that gets the most, you know, chat is, is obviously the cover song better by you better than me because of the controversy, um, over the court case or whatever. But I don't think that's really that great of a song. Most of the times, when they include covers, it's a low point in the album for me. I don't really think that they're necessary, but, um, yeah, there's not, I don't have a whole lot of gripes really for all this whole episode. It's, it's a lot of me, um, realizing with some of these albums, why there are really huge Judas Priest fans, because yeah. 
because of albums like this and the other ones I'm going to talk about, and even some we talked about on the last episode, um, I think when I gripe about Judas Priest, it's not about particular albums or even periods of the band. It's overall, I feel, that um, in the case of this album, where a song like Exciter, which is clearly a metal song, but then you'll have other songs that are absolutely not metal. And it almost seems like people don't mention, I, I'm sure I've run this into the ground, but people don't mention all the hard rock songs they made that are not metal. And yeah. my, my big problem with modern Judas Priest is they seem to have abandoned that idea. Not always. There's some, there's some good, you know, straightforward rockers, but um, I think what made them so cool especially late seventies and through the eighties was the fact that they didn't seem to be held down by any one thing. They were just Judas Priest. And if they wanted to write a metal song, they did. If they wanted to write something with more of a dancey bounce to it, they would fucking do that too. And, um, this album's got both all of those things in it. And, uh, um, heroes end is a really cool song. I, I, it's a weird closer, but I really like that song. Um, especially the riffing. Yeah, the, the I, I have a I have a weird um thing for the what would you call that descending uh riffs whenever it's like a whenever they do whenever things like chromatic. that chromatic chromatic yeah you know I'm not a I've I've just I've just written and performed music for for 25 years I just don't know what anything's called. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I, yeah, I could go on for longer about this, but it would be basically just saying the same things over and over again. It's a really strong album. The production takes away from it a little bit, but I do enjoy this period of Judas Priest because of the, the, the young confidence that I, I feel here and, yeah. um, and, you know, and Exciter rules. Exciter, I can, songs like Exciter and a couple others I'll point out in this episode are, are the ones where... I can see how this influenced bands down the line. Like I yeah. like that just hearing Exciter for the first time, the first track on the album, I could see that that could have blown a lot of people away. And um, so, yeah. So uh, yeah, here uh, it's here at my number six. Um, uh, it was, it was, it switched places with what was, what is my number five now, but we'll get to that soon. So yeah, there Ooh. you go. Stained class 78. Cool. The year I was born. <laughs> cool so my number five mm -hmm. i've gone for 1982's screaming for vengeance cool this was on the last episode for me but i also yeah. but i also think this is a really good record if i remember right it's the i think it was the top pick for you was it the top pick of the previous episode for you no it, that was turbo yes cool um, so, uh, this is the beginning. This is the first record of my favorite era of Judas Priest. And this is their 80s US mainstream breakthrough. Um, and right off of the gate, you know, Right out of the gate, sorry. That was a combination of two different phrases, right off the bat <laughs> and right out of the gate. <laughs> That's okay. We should just make our own sayings. Why do we have to use other people's sayings? Yeah. Yeah. Because you could have been standing on a gate, and then <laughs> you're jumping off of it. Fuck, I don't know. <laughs> I'm vaulting the gate because I'm breaking <laughs> the law. Yeah. <laughs> breaking the gate. Breaking, jumping the gate. Jumping the gate. <laughs> Wait, that's not uh, on, that's not on this album, okay? If you <laughs> if you think that we're gonna talk any more about that song, you've got another thing coming. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, Hellion is a fucking phenomenal opening intro. I would go as far as to say this is my favorite album intro of any of their any of their albums just like just, just that instrumental part at the beginning the hellion and electric yeah, eye. i suppose yeah because electric eye is like this behemoth at the start and then feels kind of light the rest of the way through but that opening i love electric i don't get me wrong but yeah. as a as an opening part that 
hellion thing that um opening instrumental just blows the fucking door open and lets you know you're in for a, you're in for a good time with this record it's it's going to rule the whole way through and you know it it pretty much does it's got a it's got a few highs and lows but uh, without without wasting any more time i'm going to jump into the track by track do it Cool. So, like I say, Electric Eye, fucking amazing way to open the record. Uh, Riding on the Wind, excellent driving hard rock song. Riding so- on the wind. <laughs> we should audition for, like, backup. <laughs> I, like, I, we could harmonize with Halford. That's true. But I, I have to say, like, like, I love choruses like Riding on the... Like, I, that's the thing that I like that they do. And, and some of the songs... Um, you know, they do that thing we talked about in the last episode where the, the, the end of the course is just them saying the name of the song. Yeah. And, it, that, and I was like, that's a little bit of a letdown, but writing on the wind, like that is a, you have to sing along to that. Like, it's just, yeah. it's just cool. It's a kick-ass song and it's followed up by another kick-ass Let's song. Let's go! <laughs> God, we're going to sing pretty much every chorus <laughs> from here on well, in. These, oh. That's the thing that's been fun about listening to these albums is these songs that I didn't previously know. Like, I didn't know Riding on the Wind or Bloodstone. And I'm like, oh, those are both really great songs. Way better than You've Got Another Thing Coming. <laughs> yeah. Like, that. that's the thing. Like, so many of these songs could have been singles. Like, to be honest, it's it's very pop in structure, This this album. Because I think you can kind of tell that after point of entry, they were like, okay, that one wasn't as well received as British Steel, I guess. So let's get a little more radio in there, but let's amp up the heaviness too. And that's exactly what they did. And, you know, you get great songs like Riding on the Wind and Bloodstone. And then you get, I'm I'm, going to do this for the, I'm going to do this for the, um, brackets or parentheses um take these chains <laughs> <laughs> yeah um yeah it's 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 that song is a pop metal precursor to the stuff they do on turbo to me you know it, that's that's also a very sing-along take these chains off like yeah see, take them off of my heart so fucking good and then oh Ladies and gentlemen, pain and pleasure. Stripper song. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for it. Yeah. And then we get Screaming for Vengeance, which is a great up-tempo title track. And then, you know, it, here's here's where my uh, love for the Grand Theft Auto games comes in. You've Got Another Thing Coming is on Vice City, which is set in 80s Miami. And uh, Electric Eye was on its prequel, Vice City Stories, as oh, well. Okay, okay. Yeah, there's it's a very it's a very uh, screaming for vengeance friendly couple of games. <laughs> but um, yeah, and then you get Fever, um, kind of power ballad track, really cool. And then Devil's Child is one hell of a closer. You know, it's it's. It has a similar feel to Bloodstone, and I like when they do stuff like that on this record. Yeah, and you know, I, I I gave this album quite a few listens to determine where it was really gonna sit. And for me, I feel like they this feels like the embryo for the rest of their career through the eighties and into the early nineties. And it kind of signals that this is a, a, a new revamped Judas Priest with a little more, I don't know whether or not to say, you know, there's a little more life in them because they were doing like great stuff in the 70s and, and early 80s. But I feel like this this just production wise, I think the production on this record is huge. And it really elevated their sound to a more arena and stadium feel. Yeah, and and I and, and and they clearly hit a sweet spot around this time with you know the songs they were writing. So um, yeah. that's that's undeniable when you listen to these albums. Yeah, and I think f- from here on in, 
uh, I th- <laughs> it's it's going to be pretty obvious uh, <laughs> which which era is is my favorite. So uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well then, we'll cool. then uh, we'll we'll just we'll jump a little bit further into that era that you love cool. so much for my next one. This was going to be my um, number six because pretty much just because of one song. Um, Ooh. but at the, at the end of the day, I listened to all these again and I just fucking enjoy the hell <laughs> out of ram it down. Um, yes. ram it down is, num- is my number five, uh, from 1988. <laughs> and I mean, ram it down's a great, they, they we've, we've said this a lot. They, they're really good at writing opening tracks that yeah. just you're just ready for some fucking good time. I mean, th- th- I mean to this honestly, a lot of this on here sounds like metal to me, and they yeah. and they confirm it by having songs called heavy metal and I'm a rocker. <laughs> in case <laughs> in case I was worried about it, um, <laughs> I really do think that there is a lively '80s production to this. Like it's it 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 sounds fun. And it, yeah. it, I guess it could be one of those things where people could complain that it sounds dated, and that's we've had those these arguments before about people who say that, and I'm just like, well, yeah, it's dated. It came out in 1988, so what yeah. do you want it to sound like? But <laughs> I really do, yeah. The uh, it was one of those things where when I was listening to the album, th- this shows like how my brain works because I am absolutely ready to be proven wrong. All the time. In fact, I think that is the most fun thing and the most satisfying thing where your mind is changed about something or you discover that you don't know everything about something and what you learn makes you appreciate something more. Um, The song Heavy Metal, I just looked at it in the track listing and I rolled my eyes. I'm like, okay, yeah, okay, we get it, Heavy Metal. (laughs) <laughs> but then the song comes on and I'm like, okay, this is pretty cool. I, <laughs> I'm, I'm into this. And I, I love that feeling. I love just, I love me being like, like, like knocked off my, my old head pedestal <laughs> or whatever, <laughs> or, or, uh, or soapbox, whatever the fuck you would want to say that we we're clearly, we're not good at using sayings here or what do you call it? What's the word for those? When something is a saying, it's a, I hear somebody out there listening and yelling out the word. That's right. That's the word I'm talking about. <laughs> um, uh, um, is it an idiom? I, I, I'm, I'm blanking right now. It could be an idiom, um, but I'm an idiot, so I don't know that. <laughs> um, so, oh, you're anyway, too hard on yourself. So there's the, 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 with Ram It Down, there's a little bit of leftovers from Turbo. Um, because from what I read later on, this stemmed from what was supposed to be the double album that Turbo was yeah. going to be. And so some of the songs from that ended up on Ram It Down. And so there's you get a little bit of that. Um, and then like th- th- there's one song that plays on here, and I know you're going you're gonna to talk about it. But um, when the drums start on Love Zone, I was immediately like, oh, Eddie fucking loves this. Because the, yes. the reverb is gigantic <laughs> at the beginning of Love Zone. Um, I mean, this is an 80s metal album, no doubt. Like, yeah. you're not even, there's no confusion about it, but it is a damn fun album. And um, re- really, like, I don't even mind the the we are metal kind of thing they got. Because when you're... When the songs are so catchy and so energetic and fun, I don't, I don't care. Um, yeah. Which brings us to the one thing I don't like about this album, and that's Johnny Be Good. <laughs> I, I think it <laughs> sticks out like a sore thumb. It's not an awful cover. It's just for some reason it kills the momentum of the album. Or the, the, it just hits a wall or something, you know. And um, and I and I remember seeing the video for Johnny Be Good which is one of the many reasons why I never got into Judas Priest because all, it seemed like the videos for the most part were of songs where I was like, okay, this is okay. But why, who, you know, who, who hasn't covered Johnny B. Good? Why do we have to cover this again? And also it was in an awful movie called Johnny B. Good <laughs> with Anthony Michael Hall. I don't know if you've ever seen this film. No, I haven't actually. Don't. It's one of those 80s, 80s films that slipped I, down on my grasp. I, I like a lot of really bad movies. 
Like, like some <laughs> movies that are, that are objectively or subjectively or one of those words bad are movies that I love with, I, I, I don't even, I, I do not, I will not even bat an eye talking to somebody about how much I love Encino Man. You know, it's like, that's the kind of shit I love. Yeah. Johnny B. Good is this movie where clearly Anthony Michael Hall had some juice. He was getting a little bit older and a little bit buff. And he came to them and said, Hey, can we just make a movie where like everybody loves me and I'm a jock and I'm cool. <laughs> and they're like, yes, we'll make that movie. And it's literally, just, I mean, I, I, there's a story to it, but the whole movie is just Anthony Michael Hall getting to play uh, a, a guy that is just cool. You know, <laughs> it, it, when, it, when it comes to like football and playing football anyway. So the movie, so the song is not that good and it's in a, a, a movie that's even worse than the song. So it's just one of those things where it just, it brings the album down. Um, and then um, overall, even though I love this album, I feel like it loses a little bit of steam at the end of it. I feel like a lot of their albums do that. Um, even if the second half starts off strong, I feel like s s a lot of times the last few tracks, it kind of just goes, oh, okay. You know, and um, Monsters of Rock, even though it sounds like it's supposed to be this big old, you know, rocker, it it's good, but it it, it uh, compared to like the how, the how the album begins, I don't think it ends as strong, which is why it's at number five, even though I totally enjoy this album, Ram It Down from 1988, when I was 10 <laughs> 10 years old when this came out I, I tell you what i'm just happy to see that not only myself but you know obviously someone from a different generation and a different country agrees with me that ram it down is unfairly shit on uh, yeah like, i don't i don't get that at all i really don't get the hate for this album like you know and and i've seen lists where ram it down has been like last place and Turbo has been, like, third. And I'm thinking, what really separates these two, apart from a slight heaviness, you know, in Ram It Down that... Yeah, Ram It Down's really... clearly heavier than Turbo, but... Um, yeah. I don't know. I feel like it's a weird thing how some bands will make albums like... Not 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 sonically the same, but albums that are considered low points, like Turbo and Ram It Down to some people... Um, some bands can't ever escape that. Like nobody, nobody can just enjoy Metallica. They got to point out Saint Anger. Yep. But when it comes to Judas Priest, it's not like you say, I love Judas Priest and people have to chime in and be like, what about Turbo? It sucks. Like people don't feel the need to do that with Judas Priest, which is part of my, my, my theory about the, the group think mentality of about Judas Priest, Judas Priest has a, has kind of <laughs> has kind of leveled everything out to where nobody nobody points out nobody cares about the albums that they don't like. It's almost like they just ignore them. And yeah. um, and I think that throughout the eighties they made some of their strongest shit. And maybe maybe that's why people don't like it because if you're into Painkiller and what came after, then this sounds lame. I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I can I can see how some people who are into, you know, the seventies stuff prefer the more organic. Oh yeah, even know. that, even that. If your if your favorite album is is stained class, then this sounds awful. I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, so I get I totally get it. But the but that's to be honest, like that's one of the things that made doing these episodes so much fun uh, is the fact that um, I they they didn't just make the same album for 30 years or whatever you know there you, yeah. there is a definite shift and then like a where they go from one area and they may hang out for a little while but then they move on and i, I don't know I, I think that that if if there's anything that i'm going to agree on about why they are a legendary band it's got to be that that they they did they have a a a discography that is um it's a fun ride you know all the way through yeah, yeah, for sure. And I'd much rather hear a band evolve than, you know, put out Back in Black 8, you know? <laughs> yeah, you yeah. Know I, I like ACDC, but I but I, I think doing a, a an album ranking on them 
That, it's almost <laughs> like you'd have to stack like 10 albums on top of each other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but there are some standouts. We'll, we'll have to do them at some point. But uh, Oh, for, sh- we'll for sure, there. yeah. But it's, it's, it is going to be a case of, yep, it's an ACDC album. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess you could, you can give somebody, you know, props for sticking to their guns and, and their own sound that they, you know, there's no, no band sounds like ACDC. Uh, well, bands after them <laughs> have tried to sound yeah. like ACDC. <laughs> I'm looking at you, Airborne. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, anyway, we're, we're, t- we're on Judas Priest. But yeah, that was, uh, that was Ram It Down, my, my number five. Cool. So I guess that brings me to my number four. Yep. And I have chosen for my number four the successor to Screaming for Vengeance, Defenders of the Faith. Okay. So this is the album that took what they did on the previous record, took out some of the fluff and added even more beef to the to the sound. Mm-hmm. And right off of the bat you get free will free wheel burning and yeah it's absolutely impossible to drive below the speed limit with this on it is just pure speeding metal <laughs> yeah and i f- i feel like a lot of uh, a lot of tickets were given out to people with this tape in their car <laughs> yeah um, in their in their uh in their ferraris or what was what was big in the in 84 <laughs> <laughs> the, the Trans Ams. The, the, yeah, that's what I was looking for. Shit, Trans Ams. <laughs> but yeah, and I think we need to take a minute as well to appreciate how Rob Halford because it could have easily been an absolute killer rapper. Because to pull off those like parts, like the the, the really fast singing part, about two thirds of the way into the song, I feel like. Bef- I think it's before the solo and I I've never even taken the time to learn the words. Cause it's just like, it's yeah. like, wow, holy shit. This, even the singer is going fast. You know? I, I feel, I feel um, like that's why you, you'll find a lot of people in to metal. Well, I don't want to, I, I don't want to generalize, but me and a lot of people I know who are into metal are also into hip hop. And I, th- I think there's some sort of connection there. And yeah. um, and it could be vocally, even though obviously you have a lot more actual singing talent going on in, in metal. <laughs> but I feel like there's something about the rhythmic tightness. Like you have to be tight with it. Otherwise yeah. it doesn't work, which is the same way with hip hop. Like if you're... I mean, there's a lot of popular hip hop where they they just go off the beat all the time, and my old school heart just can't take it. I'm just like, no, <laughs> why are you doing that? And so, yeah, yeah, I love moments like that where the <laughs> metal singers are real, really on with their fast vocals. Yeah, totally. And then you get um, Jawbreaker, which is this badass '80s metal track. You know, they really are playing just 80s metal on this album and that's one of those you know? songs where the end of the course is just going him going job breaker <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and i but i like that that's 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 a fucking good track clearly totally. i like it because i haven't talked about this album yet <laughs> yeah I, I was actually I've, I've been particularly excited for some reason to to talk about this album because there's a lot to talk know, about for me yeah because it is just I've I've rarely seen it at the top spot, but it never gets shit on. It sh- and, and it I'm, shouldn't be. It's yeah. It's, it's a great album. It's really it's it's just a cool. It feels good. Like it's a good. Yeah. Has a good heavy feeling to it, while still feeling def- like the eighties. Yeah, and it definitely belongs, you know, in in the top, in, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. And you get rock hard, ride free. Just another badass eighties metal track. You yeah. know. A bit more, a bit slower, uh, but goddamn. And then you get one of my favorite, easily top five or even top three Judas Priest songs for me, The Sentinel. Mm-hmm. This is an amazing song. You know, the build-up section of the song where everything drops out and it gets really intense 
still gives me goosebumps to this day. You know, that the figure stands expressionless mm-hmm. thing with all those like 80s synth things coming in. And, oh, it's just this song gets me absolutely pumped. Yeah. And there, there's there's something about that middle ground in the 80s with heavy bands yeah. that weren't afraid to, to, to bring in keys and other elements. Because sometimes it's yeah. so effective that... Um, but once again, it may be an age. What's well, I can't it can't be an age thing because you're into it. But it's a matter of taste, I guess. But I, I I fucking love it. Yeah, and there's there's one particular live performance that I'm thinking of. I'll have to find it. But it is so hilariously um, mixed. It is it just everything is like the regular volume until the drums come in <laughs> and the toms sound like fucking cannons. <laughs> because <laughs> like everything is is playing normally even the snare is ridiculously loud i'm sure the sound man was fired because he probably <laughs> deafened everyone in a five mile radius but like they're playing live and you know Dah. but like a really slowed down and drawing out epic yeah intro with um kk and um glenn tipton but then all of a sudden when the riff kicks in you just get this <laughs> and then <laughs> and kind of like shit and um yeah there's a drum fill in there as well so like, <laughs> and above everything in the mix and it just makes me cry laughing every time <laughs> but yeah uh then you get oh a little bit of uh a little bit of a classic 80s sexiness vibe when you get in the dead of night, love bites. I, I like that. I don't know love what it is about that song. I really like. Also, we now we now have another song title that we've talked about two times in two, two different episodes. Love, yep. love bites, Def Leppard and Judas Priest. We've got some overlap going here, people. That it, we'll have to we'll have to like you know put together a tally of how many we've done. I don't. There's some. There's something about the. Is sparse the right word with Love Bites? How it's not, it's got like, there's a lot of like s- space in it. It sounds like, yeah. re- re- like for a song called Love Bites, it's, it feels very like open. Well, it's, it's open, but also the, the, the vibe it creates is kind of dark in a, in, yeah. in a weird way. Yeah, it's always been a track that I felt weird about, but never, I, I never disliked it, oh, but I it was it. always like, it was always like, this feels odd, but I can't place down why. But I like it because of that. I'll take odd over a lot of other things, for, for sure. Oh, definitely. And then you get uh, Eat Me Alive, which was one of the tracks in Tipper Gore's Filthy 15 list. Oh. Back, in, back when the PMRC was uh, kicking off. And uh, there's just something about this track that, that's just like, yeah! fucking judas fucking priest you know <laughs> yeah yeah it's, it's one of those that when it comes on i think oh hell yeah you know and to be honest there's there's a lot of there's a lot of that on this record and you know some heads are gonna roll uh george lynch from Dokken openly admitting uh, openly admitted to ripping this song's riff off yeah it, a, a lot of times and, th- and th- this is one of those songs um, written by somebody else. Like, it's not a cover, but it's not. It's written by um, Bob Halligan Jr. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, they have a couple on the 80s albums here and there that he wrote. And um, I don't really know why that that it was a thing. But, I mean... It, it's, it is, but I don't care. It's a great song. I don't care who wrote it. It's, I was going to say, it's, it's probably just some dude that they adopted that was like, hey, this guy kind of shits out great ideas. Uh, let's keep him. <laughs> keep him as a pet. Yeah, I mean, if you if you meet somebody that writes really good songs and that's all they are as a songwriter, well, I, 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 I'm, I'm not one of those people that faults a band for using a song that somebody else wrote. Um, because Exactly, yeah. Because, every, I mean, I don't know. It's a, There's plenty of classic tracks out there that everybody loves that weren't written by the band that played them so who the fuck cares exactly and you know if if people are going to give people shit for um you know making uh 
well, recording songs that other people wrote, you know, you can pretty much invalidate any cover ever written. Well, that, well, that, <laughs> on, th- yeah, I think that's a different, that. that's a different thing, but yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, this is a cool song. I, let, let, I'm ready to get to the next song because I have something to say. Oh, okay. Let's go for uh, the token moody 80s triplet bass slow song with. Night comes down. Night comes down. So you, I don't. I'm not, I'm not trying to jump the gun here because I don't know if you'll say something like this or not. But next time you listen to this song, think Def Leppard, because the guitar parts are. They, it, this easily could have been a Def Leppard song, and I yeah. am not mad at them for that at all. <laughs> I'm just like I, this song is good. I've never thought about it until now, and now I totally hear there's, it. There's, there's a lot of that token or the, the guitar stuff that you would hear kind of starting maybe pyromania. Um, yeah. You, you, you hear some of that in there. And I, I'm not saying they ripped them off, but it's got that vibe that I love that when Def Leppard did it. So, I mean, I don't care. Anybody does it. I'm going I'm to dig it. And I absolutely love anything that sounds remotely like the heaven and hell baseline with that. Yeah. Love that. That always without fail gets a grin out of me. Cause I'm thinking, Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm in, I'm in for a good one. And it's always like a really moody track, but they're always good. <laughs> yeah. And then you get this, This actually is, whenever I think of, you know, to be honest, this could be the song that that gave me the term stripper riff, heavy duty slash defenders of the faith. Mm -hmm. Just that boom, boom, yeah, it's really sleazy, laid back, swingy groove. And it's just absolutely made for that setting. Uh, you know, I, I really enjoy this track and I love the anthemic bit at the end. Yes, the, the transition into the Defenders of the Faith part, I, it's a great ending, I think. I love yeah. it. And it, it, this really is just one of those... It's, it's one of those albums that whenever I look at it, I think, yeah... Yeah, that that fucking rules. Yep. You know, and, agree. and I have a few of those albums that I tend to forget about, but I know are great. And that's the thing. I, when I look at this, when I look at Defenders of the Faith, I think nobody has ever said anything negative about this record to me. Like, you know, I've heard some people say that Screaming for Vengeance is a little bit shiny. Uh, you know, Ram It Down sucks and, you know... The, they were only a real metal band after Painkiller and all these kind of different people. And then, then of course, you've just got Defenders of the Faith, which I've never, ever seen anyone say anything bad about. Yeah, honestly, the only two albums I've ever heard people talk shit about are Turbo and Ram It Down. That seems like that's it. Yeah, I will say I've, I've heard some... I have heard some pretty extreme... Uh, things about painkiller some people really hate painkiller well i mean which, I, I i didn't like it that much but i mean it's it was in my mid section that's that's the thing it was, it was like i can understand maybe mid because if if you're not into the if you're not into judas priest doing the heavy heavy thing then i get that but some people were saying it's the worst thing they've ever done oh i it's don't that's, way that's, that's ridiculous robotic. but yeah 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 like that that's a pretty Pretty extreme thing to say about that one, but I'll get, I'll, I'll get, I'll get to that one. Apparently, we will. I'll get to that one, but um, yeah, my number four, Defenders of the Fucking Faith. What a great album. Okay, so on to my number four. Um, We get to a point here where honestly, that this was where things were shifting around a lot with these top four albums because there's a lot of really good shit here. Yeah. Um, so without further ado, once again, <laughs> we've had a lot of ado on this episode, but, um, uh, for my number four, I had to go with killing machine, um, which I'm, I'm going to refer to it as killing machine. Cause that's how it was fucking released by the band. Hell and, yeah. Um, their second of two albums in 1978 with 
with uh, Stained Class being the first released in 1978. Are which, they both 1978? Yeah. I thought, it, I thought it was 1979. No, no. Killing Machine was 1978. Um, I think they had tracks released as singles in 79, obviously, because I think this was released at the end of 78. But the fact that they managed to put out two really fucking good albums in the same year. And not only that, the transition for me from Stained Class to Killing Machine is huge. Yeah. Like... Just I don't know what happened. I made the 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 analogy earlier about you know they know how to use their dicks and now they're actually getting to use them out there in their partner of choice. And yeah. it's like this is like it has that sort of I is it, maybe it's a testosterone or something. I don't fucking know. But it's it's uh, the cherry popper. It's yeah, the maybe cherry so. popping record. But um <laughs> j- delivering the goods is is um one of my favorite Judas Priest songs. It is really good yeah and and i love a good uh halftime like the chorus goes into the halftime it's yeah. it, oh it's a good groove there and that <laughs> amazing opener as usual um the production huge step up from stained class on killing Definitely. machine um, and this just overall, there is an attitude on this album that I don't think they had had on any album prior to this. Like, it's almost like, like it, it's the only way I can put it. They're just, there's a, there's a, a macho confidence that just comes through like these dudes, like it's, you know, get out of the way. We'll handle this. Like it's got that yeah. sort of vibe to it. And, um, once again, it's, it's, uh, they're, they're doing the thing that I love about, Pretty much every every uh, Judas Priest album, maybe up until Painkiller. I guess Painkiller's got a little bit of it too, but there is a variety of tracks here. There are songs that are absolutely not metal, like Burning Up. Burning Up, there's nothing metal about that fucking song, but it is good. <laughs> and um, I don't know. It's it's a, it, that that's the thing that I love about these albums is the, the as much as I love the more heavier sounding songs, I think that they the having the more sort of uh, just rock songs that seem to pull from different areas. I think they hold up those heavy songs, and the it just makes the album feel more interesting, like more of a journey that you're going through, and not just you know metal style a metal style b metal style c back to metal style a um yeah so this has just got everything on it i think it's just uh um it's a heavy album but i wouldn't call it a metal album but it has metal elements on it um but this is just uh it's just a motherfucker of an album and i've all the i don't know if i like or don't like the album cover it's (laughs) <laughs> I don't know what's going on. He's got goggles that are broken and he's staring I, into the redness. And... I think it's meant to be an explosion in his goggles. Oh, I, I don't know. okay. Yeah. Um, and then he's got a, a leather belt around his head and it looks like yeah, he's, it's... so is that supposed to be a helmet? Like he's a biker maybe? Yeah, I think, I, I think they went for the biker biker vibe i always took it as though because you see like it looks like he has a strap but the strap's not under his chin it's under his lip and then he's got that thing on his head it's almost like he's being restrained and he's having yeah. to see some weird shit go on that's blowing his mind anyway but he also he also <laughs> does he also doesn't seem very phased by it either like, like he's, he's enjoying it oh yeah it's a pain and pleasure kind of thing i get it it's yeah a, all right rob halford i get you um <laughs> So yeah, so this is one of those things where they do it. Like sometimes they'll do a variety of songs and I feel, especially on some earlier albums where it felt a little bit directionless, but this one doesn't. It just feels like how albums are supposed to be to me. I like albums that hit different highs and lows and moods. And um, this album is is never boring. Um, We talked about it before. I think the cover song on here is the weak song on the album, but it's not bad it's not johnny be good bad it's it's <laughs> it's still a good song i just kind of feel like oh, they could have left that off and just skipped over to killing machine but um it's yeah it's got a lot of good shit on it and it's um it's just uh it's a it's a classic and it's one of those things where i i understand um 
if this was somebody's number one, I'd be like, yep. So I absolutely get it. It's a it's a fucking killing killing album and a killer album, K- killing machine, <laughs> or as known in uh, America, hell bent for leather, um, which that song fucking rules. I don't really need to even talk about that. But um, <laughs> but yeah, overall, I just really I really dig this album, so that's why it's my number four. Awesome, cool. So that brings me. We're at my. We're at the top three. Top three. Okay, so the bronze medal. Goes to Turbo. All right. So Turbo was the moment they said, hey, you know what? Let's just become a glam metal band and see what happens, you know? Because they were doing great on the heels of, you know, you had Screaming for Vengeance was their breakthrough. Uh, I'd say Defenders of the Faith was the ass kicker, and then this one was the the the. <laughs> you know, actually, now I come to think of it, I don't know where I heard this, uh, but someone, on uh, it was either on like a video or a podcast or something. Actually, it could have been Chromium Dioxide Radio. I don't know whether or not it was. I can't remember, but uh, someone at some point said. Uh, the the three albums from Screaming for Vengeance, Defenders of the Faith, and Turbo, they all have the same artist doing the same artwork style, and they said it's pretty much like the first three Star Wars movies. <laughs> and this is and, this is um, Return of the Jedi. <laughs> yeah, because that may have been them. Yeah, I think it was. Now I come to think of it, great channel. Check that out. But um, shout out to Chromium Dioxide Radio, which which I I, I actually got a message from home dude from Chromium Dioxide uh, earlier today, where he's talking about how much he and his wife have been yelling at me while listening to the very first episode of this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I get oh, it. Got- I get it. I was a little bit harsh at times. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got two two more great ones they can yell at. <laughs> well, not not this one. This one's. I mean, I I'm not talking any shit at all in this episode, have I? And I haven't. <laughs> but yeah, they, they 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 said it's something like a new hope was screaming for vengeance, and then you got um, oh, fuck, what's it called? Empire Strikes Back was the badass Defenders of the Faith, and then you get Turbo, which is the Ewoks. <laughs> yeah, as as much it, as I like Turbo, I I get that. I it, yeah. that makes total sense. But I have to jump in though because you're talking about them deciding to become whatever you would call this kind of music. Um, yeah, r- real like pop metal, maybe I guess. Um, yeah, the, I don't. I don't. It doesn't seem forced to me. Like they. I don't. Oh no no. Because no, no, yeah. in 1986, like metal and heavy rock was popular so this feels I, I i think i talked about this in the last episode where this feels like an honest album like they just wanted to do this and so oh, that's I, I why agree, i think yeah. it sounds so fucking good because it doesn't sound forced it sounds like a band that went everybody else is doing this shit but we're kind of feeling this let's get the keyboards coming in here and let's you know let's uh let's let's pull in some technology here and um God, I, yeah, it's a. I mean, we talk. I've already talked about this album, but I, I really like this album. This album was almost in my top six, but just got barely nudged out to number seven. I will say, you know, keyboards in metal is something I have never complained about. And <laughs> welcome, I, you know, if if they're gonna throw in like a bunch of like, if they're gonna throw in like eight extra, you know, channel strips, and it's all different keyboards and arpeggiators and shit. Throw that in the mix because I, you know, I'm an '80s fan. I, I, I like '80s stuff, and this album, uh, you know, is the absolute epitome of of where the quote unquote pop metal sound was at in the mid '80s. You know, yeah. this is easily their most '80s album. Oh yeah. Like, and it's shamelessly '80s in both the imagery the sound, the packaging, everything. And even the artwork looks more 80s than the two predecessors. Like, the two predecessors looked cool and, and unique, but this one definitely looks like a 
Like what's what's on the what's on the album cover? Is it like a candy cane hand job? <laughs> <laughs> So I was actually going to be serious, <laughs> but now that you're saying that, I like that. In fact, I'm going to start, you want to start a band and we're going to call ourselves Candy Cane Handjob? Candy Cane Handjob. And we're just going to do <laughs> covers of songs from Turbo. <laughs> it was, it's clearly a, a woman's hand or a hand with nail polish on it. I don't even mean to assign genders here, but um, it, it's a gear shift, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and um, but I, it can I, also I be like, a euphemism. I like well. That's why I think that's why I like this album cover so much because it's uh, it it's it's really good. It's it, it might yeah. be my second favorite uh, with uh, British Steel as the as yeah. the, it, something about album covers where the the concept is so simple but it's done really well because yeah. you look at the de- defenders of the faith uh, artwork I, and I, I don't even know what the fuck is happening on that. It's like a <laughs> it's like a huge monster tank or some shit. I don't know. But this is just. I always so... got, I always got Optimus Prime vibes. Yeah, totally. But I don't know. From... I, I I think this looks really cool. Like this is the kind of thing that I'd put that on my wall as a huge poster. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, I love this era of the band. I really do, and like even the videos and you know any live footage of of this era. You know they'd gone like whole hog with with just making sure every little thing was blown up to be huge and, and just this absolute stadium experience. And, yep. you know, Turbo, Turbo Lover opening track. What a great song to open with, you know? Yeah. Locked In. L- Locked In has a ridiculously fun synth part in that. That, like, really slidey one, like... Yeah, yeah it's, that's a great... This this album, to me, has has starts off really strong. Yeah. And it makes me laugh as well, because if I remember correctly, the locked-in video... I think the videos for Turbo Lover and Locked In are connected, aren't they? I, like, I think there's a narrative with the two of them. I don't know. I think, I, I've seen the Turbo Lover video. I don't know if I've seen the locked-in one. <laughs> the thing that I love about the t- the Turbo Lover video before I even get to the locked in one is the fact that, you know, they're just inexplicably driving around the desert yeah. in their stage regalia with these weird ass stop motion, like really cool looking evil skeleton robot things chasing after them kind of wily e. Coyote style. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, every now and again you'll have this, like, 80s supermodel woman just on the screen, just, like, oh, like kind of looking at the screen if, on if a only, motorcycle. If only you guys could have seen the moves he was just doing. It was, <laughs> it was pure sex. Oh, oh, for sure. <laughs> you, you don't specialize in 80s metal and not be a horn dog. <laughs> it was... I mean, I guess you had to do that. You had to have a lady in your video. You know, about, oh, for sure. I mean, shit, we, what kind of a band were you? <laughs> and then you people, get, people would think you were gay or something <laughs> <laughs> which brings me to locked in which sees rob halford kidnapped by a shitload of women and locked in a cage all right and so now i need to go watch this video I, I may have seen it before but now i'm all like that sounds great i'm gonna i want to watch that yeah i i need to rewatch it because it was a long time ago but as far as i i'm aware i remember it being hilarious Judas Priest's videos have always been funny. Yeah, you know, th- there's always been humor in them, even even with like breaking the law and stuff. And uh, but yeah, this album is pure fun. Like if someone condensed fun into a disc, this is fun. You know, Private Property could have easily been in a movie during this era. Yeah. Uh, parent- parental guidance keeps we the same thing. Need- no, no, sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> oh, oh God. Uh, that's a fun down, song. Down, down. <laughs> it, I, I get a very Bill and Ted feel from this album. It's it's just <laughs> that it's just that fun party vibe going on throughout it, you know? Rock you all around the world. Kinda dumb, but that yeah, that's helps. exactly what I said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Kinda dumb. Yeah, like that that's the thing. I, I love it though. It just keeps it going, and then "Out in the Cold" has easily one of the best keyboard intros of all time. 
especially with that like perfectly placed um like snare drum that comes in like just to really accentuate when it goes off but god like looking at this all of these songs on this album are just great fun wild nights hot and crazy days like a bit of a mouthful could have probably benefited from some like you know brackets on that song but <laughs> yeah you know if that's not a glam metal title i don't know what is and then you get hot for love again you know shamelessly 80s but i love it and then you get reckless which closes out the album and this was actually meant to be on the top gun soundtrack which makes okay. it even more 80s yeah and like it, unfortunately that didn't come to be but thankfully it stayed on the album and yeah i just i love turbo and i remember people always saying oh but it's not like a metal album from them and i'm like i don't care yeah it's yeah <laughs> like do i do i need something to be a certain thing to enjoy it you know sounds kind of shit if you if you listen to music like that it's just judas priest being judas priest like they decided to do and that that's i think that that's great like it's i don't know i i'm not i'm not uh i i i feel like there's a there's a, a mindset that you or you get into when you are fully a judas priest fan um that maybe you see things a bit differently but i i don't i i see it as I, I, I enjoy the band more when it feels more natural what they're doing. And this just feels like a natural thing to them. I, I don't I don't know. It just I, I like I like I said, it sounds like an honest album from a band that just wanted to try something a little different. Totally. And you know, I agree that it, it sounds honest. It doesn't sound forced. Yeah, you know, I I don't think there are, there's I don't think there's an awful lot of their albums that that do sound forced, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, obviously that there's a few moments, but you know, it, they really did just, they, they didn't so much go with the times, but they did, but they did it on their own terms. You know, they, they never tried to sound like anyone else. They just did a, that period's version of themselves. Yeah. You know, they would, they were never trying to be, they never tried to be Motley Crue because this doesn't sound like Motley Crue. This doesn't sound like Poison. It just sounds like Judas Priest, but with more fun themes and more keyboards, you know? Yep. And um, that is, that's my take on Turbo. Yeah. It's a, I, I, it's a great album. And um, yeah, like I said, almost in my top six, but didn't quite make it. But now we're on to my number three. Um, we're going to be talking about the album that I think is the best album um, of their 70s output. Um, we're going to talk about Sin After Sin from nice. 1977. <laughs> this was one where, because we talked about on the very first episode, Sad Wings of Destiny, which I just think is not a very good album. Um it, it it's and, ouch <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not it's not great it's just uh it you know it's it was low on my list and um the listening to them in order once this started once this album started i was just like oh okay here they are here yeah. here's judas priest um it just feels so good and the production is is better than um than sad wings of destiny once again, Way I don't. I, once again, I don't know if the version I was listening to with Sad Wings was some horribly remastered version or not, but it didn't sound good at all. Whereas this one sounds um, really good. It's got that clear '70s production to it, but not as light as the stained class would end up being. But um, Sinner is a great fucking opener again. Um, really, like this album has such a good energy to it. Um, this, this was, um, to be completely honest, when I, when I was going through their albums for a long time, this was number one because it, really? had, it was the first one that had really all the way through made me go, fuck, this is good. 
And yeah. that feeling kind of stayed with me as I was listening to their other albums. But when I went back and listened to everything, I went, okay, this is still a crazy good album. But obviously I got two above this one. But um, once again, variety of songs. I, I love the Judas Priest variety on these albums. And I really do think that the songwriting, it, they, they just hit something with this. And when you get to songs like uh, Let Us Pray slash Call for the Priest, like that's another one of those songs that like I can hear bands being influenced by that song as it's playing. I'm just like, I, I get this. Like songs like yeah. that are the the things that make me understand the Judas Priest love that's out there because it's just, I mean, that's a metal track and it just, I don't know. There's a lot, there's just such a good, um, but from their first album to second album to this, this is a, a, an absolute progression uh, with their sound. And, um, I don't think like there's, I don't have anything bad to say. There's, there's no bad track on this album even even the fact they covered a Joan Baez song, and that is so far away from the kind of things that I listen to, but the way they did it, I'm just like, well, clearly that's a great song because if, I mean, any cover song, even though you might think a cover is better than the original, there's obviously great qualities in the original track if, yeah. if they were able to create this cool version of it. Uh, Diamonds and Rust is the song. Did I already say that? I don't know if I did. But <laughs> this is just a, such a, it's it's, it's such they just honed in on what they were doing so well on this album and i feel like it's almost like they they this is the like the springboard like from this they went to stay in class which kind of felt like it was just naturally came out of them because of the momentum for making sin after sin and then they get to killing machine when they when they all of a sudden get way more confident about it. But Sin After Sin has this vibe of a band just looking at each other and being like, yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> like they, it just feels so much like they just all of a sudden knew it. They were, they knew they had it and here it is. And um, it's a fucking cool album. Uh, Sin After Sin, my number three. Awesome. So sh- yeah, you pretty much covered it. Like that's, it is a great album, and I did I did I put it as my favorite of the seventies era, or was that? Mm, I don't uh, remember. It was either that one or Killing Machine. Yeah, well, yeah. Kill, well, Killing Machine is 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 not seventies, or no, it is seventies. Yeah, you're right. Seventy. <laughs> so yeah, never mind. Seventy eight. Yes, you're right. That's the thing, though. It, it just goes to show that you had to think there that. that you know how how much they step their sound up on uh, Killing Machine that it, it doesn't feel like part of their seventies. Yeah, that's era. The, that is the thing that blows me away. And I know maybe it has something to do with with when you're older, maybe you're not as as excited and not as inspired. But all these bands from this time period, the ones that are really big, some that I enjoy more than others, but you know names that come to mind. Uh, uh, you know, you have Jewish priests like Rush, uh, uh, Aerosmith, um, um, who, uh, soon after that Iron Maiden, once you get into the eighties, but all yeah. of these bands did so many albums, so close together of really good shit. And then you get yeah. to later on in their careers where there's like many years apart from the albums and the albums don't seem as inspired and cool as the shit that they were just churning out. So there's something, there's a weird thing about that where, and I know it's youth, it's probably youth and, <laughs> and, and probably the, you had to do it, I guess, because you're, you're on a cycle of, of that's how you make the money. You got to put out the album to go on tour and blah, 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 and keep it going, keep the machine rolling. But you know, as much as I could see how that would be a pain in the ass and really stressful, I feel like so much great music came out of that whole cycle that was happening in the seventies and eighties. And yeah. it's, it's, it's insane. So yeah, I mean, all, this whole, like I said, starting, starting with sin after sin, I feel like these dudes just fucking took off and, um, it, the the I, I yeah it, it's just we're moving in you move into an era where I think everything they did up to painkiller which is painkiller's fine 
but um, there's just an excitement to it, to hearing where they go and how how they did such good shit in such a short period of time. Because 10, 10 years is not that long when you think about it, you know? No. From, when you're, from when you're born to when you're 10, that doesn't seem like anything. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't have anything else to add there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is amazing how these bands used to just churn out classic after classic. Like, and even sometimes too within the same year. It was it was just yeah. such a one that sticks out to me is you know early Black Sabbath. I know I know we're on kind of a tangent here, but it is extremely impressive how much music came out of these bands back in the day. Because even new bands nowadays, they're not really putting out an album a year, as as far as I know. Like the the standard minimum is like two, yeah, two years. Which I I mean I. I can see the, the, I don't know, the positives about taking your time with an album, but I don't know. Sometimes I feel like there's a momentum and, um, when you just keep rolling with it, I think good shit just continues to come out. If you're a great band, you know, it just, yeah. it just happens that way. And, uh, yeah, it's always good for the fans cause they get a shitload of music in a short span of time. <laughs> Absolutely. Cool. So my number two. Number two. So this is not only going to reveal what my uh, unless you unless you haven't been keeping track. I haven't been keeping track of my own list. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> but uh, this is going to reveal to uh, you at least whether or not what you think is going to be my number one. Okay, is my number one. So my number two. Drum roll. <laughs> It doesn't doesn't have the same same power on a thigh. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got number two as Ram It Down. Nice. Okay. So it's heavier than Turbo, but it still has that pop men, pop metal kind of feel to it. So yeah, yeah, I totally veins. know what your number one is. <laughs> 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 okay, well, let's, let's talk Ram It Down now. Cool. So, you know, Ram It Down blasts him with an absolute burst of energy. You, you can already tell that they've stepped it up uh, you know, aggression-wise from the previous record, which was very accessible, whereas this one just comes in fucking all guns blazing, which we'll get to... All guns blazing! <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. But, uh, yeah, so it's like i say it's heavier than turbo but still very pop metal you got ram it down blows the doors open and then you've got heavy metal which shows us that turbo's still kicking around in there somewhere but uh with a harder edge to it and then you get the absolute lesson in cock rock 101 <laughs> which is love zone you know a that title is absolute 80 sleaze perfection yeah b what a fucking great riff like just in in between rob just absolutely screaming through this you know that like yeah. it's, it's like his, a, his vocals on this album are take a huge step up from turbo like yeah. it almost seems like his like there's he, he he's in a mid range most of the way through turbo, whereas this one it brings back in like that the large the the huge range that that Rob Halford has is more on display on this album. Yeah, he does a lot of high vocals on here, almost to excess. But I kind of love <laughs> yeah. it. I love that he kind of just stays in in like the high notes pretty much right the way through Love Zone. Uh, come and get it, you know. Is is just a get the beers out this is party time kind of song uh I, I hard love, as I, iron i love how three songs in a row feel like they could be talking about his dick yeah. <laughs> like, like, come and come and get it in my love zone because it's gonna be hard as iron <laughs> <laughs> and then he finds out he's getting his wings because there's blood red skies oh my goodness you had to go there <laughs> I'm sorry, ladies. <laughs> you, you set me up for that one. <laughs> but uh, yeah, come and get it. Is is just party time, you know? 
hard as iron, indulges in some speed metal while retaining some light-hearted feel. It's a very power metal song, Hard as Iron, because mm-hmm. it has that intensity, but it also it's got a major key chorus, and it's uh, just that kind of feel-good, intense style of metal that Judas Priest were very influential on. Uh, and then, of course, Blood Red Skies is this huge, big, epic song. You know, used like I used to play this album all the time back when I first got it, and this song, this song really stood out to me. This song, <laughs> <laughs> you know what? We, we talk a lot. We're not going to get everything perfect. <laughs> um, you got I'm a rocker, which is cheesy in a in a charming way i i you know i still feel proud to sing this you know i am a rocker and, I, and i'm proud of it but uh <laughs> you know it, there's a part in the verse though like where i'm i'm i've always been kind of wary where that where the uh where the melody goes the like the greatest times i've ever known like that where he kind of goes down i'm like I'm sorry. What? <laughs> what, what? What? What note was that? <laughs> I, like, I, it could be how it's mixed, and it, but yeah, I've just I've always felt weird about the first melody in this song. But, yeah. Uh, then you get Johnny Be Good. I can't lie. I I like it, but uh, it, it's mainly for that um, solo in in the middle, which uh, yeah, you know, doesn't really have much to do with the original, <laughs> but. Uh, Love You to Death, you know, actually, I forgot to mention, there's two stripper songs on this album. Three, maybe, if you include <laughs> if you include heavy metal in that. But um, Love Zone and Love You to Death, which, you know, both have the word love in it, which I would say Love You to Death, though, has the edge because it has a whip crack in it at the start. <laughs> and it's just like this immensely sleazy groovy song and then right at the end you get monsters of rock which is this big epic closing track and you know i'm surprised like love zone caught your attention with the gated reverb and and not this one with this huge reverb well, tail on i think it's because everything. that's love zones early on in the album and it starts off with the drums on their own yeah so it's real obvious also, yeah, Mo- Monsters of Rock was the Monsters of Rock concert series. Did that already happen when this came out, and were they just stealing a name <laughs> from something, or did, I, or I, did it happen after this and they named it after the Judas Priest? I think Monsters of Rock had already happened. I think it was in the mid eighties, or yeah, maybe even earlier. Yeah, 80s. for sure. Because this is nineteen eighty eight, so this is pretty late f- for a, for an eighties album. Nineteen eighty late. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm really impressed with this album. Always have been. Always thought it was extremely underrated. And uh, I, I will fight anyone in the parking lot of my local McDonald's if you want to debate <laughs> this album. <laughs> but um, yeah. Okay. Well, then that brings me to my number two, which will, if you're if you're uh, paying attention, you'll this will reveal what my number one is. <laughs> Um, so we've now gotten to two albums that, um, like these, I, either one of these could be number one to me. I, yeah. I, I love both of these. These are both albums that now that we've come out the other end of doing these episodes, these are the two that I'm all, are going to be the first ones I try to go get on vinyl, like old school copies of them because they're just f- so fucking good. My number two, yeah. number two. From 1981, Point of Entry. Wow. Which was very low on your list, if I remember right. I think it's funny, like, you you know how we had, like, overlaps and stuff? Yeah. I think this was my second last and your second top. Yeah. Yeah. So opposite ends. This album is so good. Even if the album cover is a little bit, what? (laughs) It's like... (laughs) I don't even know what this is. It's, is it the wing of a plane? Is it, is it one of those things where you're supposed to see a different image in it? If you look at it differently, I don't know. It's just, have you seen, have you seen the U S version? Yeah. Which just, is that just printer paper going Yeah, in the, in the desert? It's, it's, 
both of them are extremely weird covers. Yeah, I mean, I like how it looks. The, the color scheme of it is very cool, but it is very like a was it supposed to be something else and that didn't work out, and so they just put yeah. this. But the album itself, kicking it off with heading out to the highway, which is so good. It just yeah. feels good. Like that's, I, I I would put that on a mix of songs. Like if you're if you're about to you know go out and you really want to get pumped, like heading out to the highway is just so good. And don't go is really fucking. Oh, don't go is such a great song. Every song on this album is great. I, I, that's all I'm gonna say about it. There's there the even even the ones on the latter half of the album that aren't quite as strong. They're still just competing. They're still amazing songs competing with super amazing songs, in my opinion. And I love the whole vibe of the album. The production of the album is really good. It sounds great. Um, and then, I mean, I, I guess it is a production wise. It's very similar to British steel. I think it sounds similar. Um, but the songwriting, I think they it's, Whereas I, when I talked about British Steel, I talked about how there were strong songs, but then a whole bunch of weak ones. And so it's an album that I think gained a lot of hype for whatever yeah. reason. But overall as an album, it, it, it just didn't stay together for me. Whereas Point of Entry, I feel like they, all, of the, all of the excess baggage has been shed and it's just a real tight collection of songs. And not only that, like I love, we talked about it earlier, talking about songs like Riding on the Wind. Um, th this album has a lot of choruses that really deliver. Like, yeah. like, like, like I, I understand the pitfalls of songwriting, and obviously I'm not that great of a songwriter because otherwise I wouldn't be here talking to you. I'd be out making money <laughs> <laughs> writing songs. <laughs> but I do, But I do realize that, you know, you can't, write a winner every time. And sometimes you'll write a verse that is so fucking strong. And sometimes the chorus, you just don't have it in you to keep it going on the momentum of going up. And so you'll have these songs where during the verses, you're like, yeah. And then the verse comes and you go, or the chorus comes and you go, Oh, okay. I still, li <laughs> I still like the song, but it didn't build up to where I wanted it to go. Whereas I think these songs all have that thing where it starts off strong and then it just kicks up to these, these really cool choruses and um, even the guitar work on this is just, it's everything sounds so good and it's real energetic. Um, it also just once again, just, you know, keeps that variety of songs that I love so much, but I feel like on this particular album, I, I think that they're all just so well written and it's just a solid album. Um, so I really do think also this, this, like we were talking, what we were talking about comparing turbo to ram it down vocally British steel for Rob Halford is pretty good. He sounds good on it, but point of entry, he, he has a lot more going on vocally with choruses and stuff. He, his, I feel like he is utilized way better on this album than he is on British steel. And I honestly have nothing bad to say about this album because it um, it was one that I really loved when I first listened to it. And then when I went back to listen to it again, I'm like, yeah, yeah, this fucking kills. This just, it's got everything I want, really, uh, from, a, from a Judas Priest album. Except there is one that I believe is better. And uh, we'll get to that next. But that was my number two point of entry. You've actually made me want to uh, revisit Point of Entry because now that you've said all of that and perhaps if I approach it from more of a hard rock angle than yeah, a yeah. metal angle. No, I, yeah, it's, 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 it's definitely a hard rock album, but I also really like hard rock, especially oh. late 70s, early 80s hard rock. Like I, and I don't know. I just feel, I feel like they, they nailed it with their songwriting. There's just... Uh, there's a quality, there's a high quality to everything. Not only the riffs and the performances and the song and the vocals, everything just feels like they they just had this strong collection of songs, and then they that's it. It's a no, it's an all killer, no filler kind of album to me. Cool. I'll I'll go back and revisit it because now that you've said all that, I do feel like I was kind of harsh on it with its placement. 
being so far down. Yeah. Well, I mean, to, t- to be fair, you weren't harsh on anything, really, except for Nostradamus. <laughs> yeah, tr- <laughs> true. True. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we, but, are we at uh, number one now? We're at number one. So for me... Shit. We made it. My... <laughs> the journey is over, folks. We have made it to number one. We did it. We, we fucking did it. We did Judas Priest. So my number one, I, I had to go with Painkiller. For, for me, Painkiller is, in case you didn't gather from my reaction last episode, yeah. <laughs> to, it, to, to it not being in the top, um... You know, I actually, uh, I fucking adore you, painkiller. I, I can do, I can do an impression of you. you I said, I, I, I don't remember what number it was, but I said painkiller, and you go, what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm pretty uh, sure is probably about. Well, I mean, not that we have that many people listening. Um, at least ten people probably also said that <laughs> to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to to me personally. Uh, this album is is pure metal excellence from start to finish insanely fucking good you know it painkiller you and i are both in agreement that painkiller is just six minutes of pure killing it yeah like, yeah it, it's yeah. They, they if they put out here's the thing if painkiller if they just said hey, here's one song and that's our whole album then this would be it would be way high up on the list because i'm just <laughs> like not only do they have the audacity to put out one song on an album but um it's a, it's just it's just so good it's just one of those songs that it never gets old to me and that's the thing and i think this is where we differ now so hell patrol shows that they can back it up and that track one wasn't just a fluke because I feel like it's not as good as the opening track, but it's still damn good metal. And then you get all guns blazing, and they're just showing off at this point. You know, they've got a, they've got a new drummer, and I think Ram It Down was largely uh, sequenced with a drum machine. Actually, if oh, yeah. I if I yeah, I th- I think. There was a lot of programming going on on Ram It Down. And once you kind of hone in on it, it kind of becomes quite glaring. But Interesting. I, and, yeah, I, I don't even know. And I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, kind of shit on the name of, of Dave Holland. Uh, he wasn't really a double kick drummer. And you, you didn't really get much of that up until... Uh, uh hard as iron on the previous album and i think that album kind of like they were kind of coming to a head anyway i think there were like creative differences and things like that is that why this album goes overboard with the double kick (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah that's it's too that's why i'm coming yeah because i what's his name i remembered his name all the way up until i had to do this episode the drummer on this album yeah scott travis Scott Travis, that's the one. Yeah, like they're like, holy shit, we've got a guy that that can do double kick and do it consistently, like the whole time. And, he, like, and he's cool. all like, don't you think I should do something different for the chorus? No, just keep the double <laughs> kick going. <laughs> <laughs> and then, which brings me right to Leather Rebel, which is ninety percent double kick. <laughs> which yeah, it's it's unnecessary, but I mean. That's that's the thing about this album is I feel like it's it is it is backpedaling. That's why it doesn't hold up for me because it really feels like oh shit we got to make something metal, and it's not bad. It's just it do, Turbo feels more honest than Painkiller does to me. See, I I feel like while yeah they're probably taking note from their contemporaries. For me, it's hard to deny the fact that. Metal Meltdown is fucking sick. And to, to me, you know... <laughs> Are you serious? Me, the chorus of that's kind of lame. Here oh, yeah. comes the Metal Meltdown. It's, it's very... It's very... I mean, obviously, he sounds way cooler than I just did. <laughs> it's very... It's kind of it's kind of weak sauce, but I mean... But I don't... I, to each their own. Oh, oh. Lyrically, lyrically, this album has some cartoon moments. <laughs> I'm I'm not gonna lie, right? There are some there are some bad lyrics on here that's like, ah, 
this is what heavy metal is. Total spinal tap shit going on here. But the music, in my opinion, is some of the you know with the with the notable exclusion of of um jugulator this is some of the most visceral thrashy uncompromising stuff they ever did and i i gotta say i like what they did here and and the fact that they just have this album which is so overtly and unapologetically metal even if they even if they stylistically weren't this way to begin with yeah this album for some reason just absolutely punches me right in the face every time i turn it on i feel i feel like maybe this album uh is 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 tarnished because of everything the band did afterward i i so if so let's say two two different stories that you know different realities one being this is the last judas priest album if that was the case, I think I would enjoy it a lot more because it, I do like that they did something different. Yeah. But or if they had decided to start making stuff with more of a variety again, or gone in a completely different, you know, direction with the next album, then this would stand out as like, okay, they tr- they did this thing here and it was cool. But the like I've said before, and the thing that everyone wants to yell at me about, where it, it just feels like at this point they they just they felt like they needed to do metal so much that it yeah. it makes this album feel less special now. Whereas I, at the time, hearing Painkiller for the first time, I was like, "This fucking rules." I think I said it on the last episode uh, when I was when I was a kid and I first heard this. I thought to myself, "Oh, I didn't know Judas Priest made metal," <laughs> and, so, <Yeah. laughs> and they did it pretty damn well. So I feel like maybe in 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 regards to this album, like you said with Point of Entry, I think I am a little bit harsh on it, but maybe it's because of all of the things that have happened after and this overwhelming. Uh, uh, idea that Judas Priest is just this metal band, and I'm like, there's so much more than that, though. There's there's so oh, much yeah. more to them than that, and I want to hear those other things. But um, so yeah, I think I am a little harsh because I'm looking at the track listing now, and just some of these songs, I'm like, yeah, there's some, some pretty fucking cool songs on here. So that's the thing. Like for for me. You've got Painkiller, and then the trio of Leather Rebel, Metal Meltdown, and Nightcrawler, for me, are just so fucking badass. Even if the lyrics are, you know, this caricature of, of the over-the-top metal of the of the day, yeah, I still love how unapologetically, um, you know, double-kick thrashy it is, because it... it up to this point, we haven't had this kind of metal from Judas Priest. It was always very, uh, you know, it was riffy and more driving rock on steroids. Whereas now it's yeah. just straight up, oh, shit. Honestly, I feel they, like there, there were little hints of this all yeah. the way back on Defenders of the Faith. I, oh, think there's I, a li- I, I think there's a little bit of what would come out here on that. Yeah, I would agree. There there are moments, like, they could have hit Painkiller, like, not that I would have ever wanted this to happen, because, you know, Turbo and Ram It Down are, you know, my third and second picks, but <laughs> they, could, they could have arrived at Painkiller as early as 1986 if they stuck to the metal thing rather than, you know, feeling like they wanted to do a more poppy thing yeah so i feel like in an alternate reality where they skipped over the whole glam stuff they would have gone maybe done an album that sits in between defenders and painkiller so like kind of the the kind of taken maybe ram it down the song and then made all of the songs on ram it down sound like that yeah, maybe. I love this alternate reality talk. It's fun. <laughs> yeah. There's like an alternate history YouTube channel. I think it's literally called Alternate History. I love I love doing stuff like that on here where it kind of talks about like, you know, what what if this person never joined or you know, I I just I just love talking about 
I mean, to be to be honest, I, I I feel like our speculations are just as valid as our opinions. Like, who the fuck cares? <laughs> at the end of the day, at the end of the day, who really cares? It's more. <laughs> I'm just glad anyone gets any entertainment out of this at all. <laughs> oh, to- totally. Like I, I just you know, between the hammer and the anvil, it, it's a deeper cut, but I, I still love it. A touch of evil. I love a that ballad one. type track. You know. It doesn't even feel like a ballad though. No, but it's it just ha- a slower tempo song. It's it's great. Yeah. But it's got the keys on it, which is like I, the I last too. the last trace of whatever Ram It Down had. Ram it down and turbo. There's just that tiny little bit of that in Touch of Evil. But then you got Battle Him slash One Shot of Glory, which is a cool way to end the record. I just I've always loved this album and this was the first I actually have it here somewhere. I've got a I've got a Judas Priest um C D bundle that I got from like HMV and this is one of the oldest things in my collection. I actually have a Judas Priest original albums classics like bundle of five records and, mm-hmm. and they kinda took the the icons of their catalog and it's got sin after sin uh british steel turbo painkiller and angel of retribution and those were the first five albums i heard and that's that's I, interesting it's kind of hitting all the different periods yeah and it's like you've got this you've got the 70s you've got the early 80s you've got the mid 80s you've got their whatever style of aggressive metal they did on painkiller you know whether or not it'd be like thrash power or whatever you'd like to call it they, did, they, uh, they didn't and, want to put demolition in there <laughs> <laughs> i was gonna say I, I, th- I think they've pretty much written the the ripper era out of uh out of the timeline unfortunately you know i i liked i at least liked jugulator a lot it's so, so weird how that this period of time is so it's so neck and neck with Iron Maiden. Like yeah. they put they put out an album in ninety, their singers leave a year or two later, they get a new guy that isn't as well received, and then in, in the early two thousands all of a sudden everybody comes back. <laughs> it's like yeah. <laughs> it's almost like they were talking to each other. Rob Halford and Bruce Dickinson were just like, hey, you know what we should do to really fuck things up? <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's let's fuck off you know a little bit after 1990 and see what happens and then meanwhile while over in the black sabbath camp you've got bill ward wondering whether or not whether or not to <laughs> return to the band for the 70th time <laughs> Jeez. but uh yeah love you bill <laughs> but uh yeah that uh black sabbath video coming up soon by the nice. way nice uh, i'm ready the, the script is written on it. The script is like I looked at the word count. It's like five thousand words. <laughs> Holy shit! Biggest, okay. Biggest video to date is I'm gonna shoot it soon, but um, on account of certain things, certain developments recently, I have to wait another two weeks before I can go and see my grandparents again. And my studio is at their house, which is just up the road. But uh, awesome! Just yeah. so, just so everybody knows, if you're listening to this for the first time. Um, we have YouTube channels, Eddie Sparks. You go look Eddie Sparks up um, on YouTube. He has a channel where he does really entertaining videos. Um, he's, it's, oh, it's, it's kind of, um, I mean, my favorites are the, are the band, the band bios that you do because I, I, I'm I, going back I, to that, yeah. I really didn't care that much about Europe, but all, but that was, a, I was entertained enough to where I'm like, well, shit, now I know all about Europe and I didn't even know that I wanted to know. <laughs> Um, and then I have my own, which is under old head at, uh, and, and, and I do uh, a lot of just shit where I just talk and I piss people off and things like that. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how <laughs> I, I love do when it. That happens. I don't know how I <laughs> piss people off so much, but I, but I do, I, I guess people just look at my face and they don't like it. I don't know. No, I like it. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, I'm sorry. We're inter- so yeah, so we were, we were still on painkiller. Uh, yeah, I've pretty much covered everything with, with painkiller. I did just, you, did you talk about one shot at glory? I, I did mention it. Yeah. Okay. But it's, it's just, it, it is a, you are right. It is a consistent double kick, slightly mid tempo thrash album, but I, I love how different it is in 
context to the rest of their discography leading up to it. You know, it, to me, I kind of treat Painkiller as its own thing, whether or not, you know, it, it had, it, it does influence every other album they've done since. But looking at this as a standalone album, when I put it on, I think, fuck, this is good. You know, I, I, any other Judas Priest album, I'll think maybe, maybe I'll put that one on. But if, but if somebody says, Hey, do you want to stick on painkiller? I'm like, yeah, stick, to put be, it on. To be honest, <laughs> I, I don't think I would say no to that either. Like it's, that's, you know, <laughs> I think there's certain albums that even, even when we're picking them apart for these episodes, there's some albums that I feel like as a metal head, you, you just, you enjoy is something, there's something, that's released in your bloodstream that, you know, feels good. Oh, for sure. But yeah, that is, uh, that is, uh, my number one with painkiller. Cool. Okay. So we've made it to number one and my number one, after going through the entire discography for the first time, aside from a couple albums. And, it, like I said, I rearranged these last six, a couple times and the last time that I went through and listened to the albums again, this was the one that I'm, I don't know what it does, what, why it's connected with me so much, but it feels great. And it was probably the one that I remember sitting down the last time I listened to it. And sometimes I'll listen to an album and I'll do other things, but I just sat there and this album just played and I'm like, God damn. This is really yeah. good. My number one, Defenders of the Faith hey. from 1984. And th this is a heavy album. It's um, comparing it to Screaming for Vengeance. There's a, there's a thing where I guess Defenders of the Faith to me sounds the first, it sounds 80s for the first time. Um, yeah. Whereas I, I, even, you know, up until Screaming for Vengeance, I still think that it didn't sound, it doesn't feel like an eighties album. Those feel like they could be late seventies in certain areas anyway. Yeah. But, um, defenders of the faith has the full on eighties drum sound in it and production, but it also feels really heavy. And, yeah. um, I don't think necessarily they were breaking any new ground here. I, it's hard to explain why this one, ended up being the one that just felt the best because it's the, they're honing in a lot more on the metal aspects here, which is interesting because they hone in on these metal aspects of their sound only to totally drop them um, with Turbo. But um, we, we went through this album already. Um, you know, Love Bites is a fucking, is a, kind of an odd song and I love it. Um, Night Comes Down, Def Leppard, you know. <laughs> um, I, like, I, like, it's just one of those things where I really do think as an album, similar to what I said about, um, point of entry, it just has a nice flow to it. It just feels like a really solid collection of songs put together really well. And it's got the big 80, I love the big eighties metal sound. And I think that maybe adds a little bit to my enjoyment of this because it's, it's really the only one in the 80s that sounds like this. There's a little bit of this on Ram It Down, but not much. And yeah. so I think that that's why I like it so much, because it's it sounds like 80s metal, and the songs are there. They're catchy songs, but they're also heavy songs. And once again, I love the albums where Rob Halford really gets to do a lot vocally, um, because he is undeniably one of the best vocalists there, you know, doing it um, of anything really. Like, I don't think we need to even say metal. I, I, I feel like he could probably sing anything. Um, yeah, totally. Especially with stuff like, um, I think it's epitaph where he goes like full on Sinatra mode. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's, there are some, there's some, I don't know what album we talked about it last time. There's that there, there's a last song on an album where he does real, soulful t sounding vocals oh that um, was uh 
evil fantasies. Yes, from I, I, I lo- Machine. Yeah, it's it, it's it's so good when he does that. But um, I'm a yeah. It's it's because uh, I, I I like a lot of '80s metal. I, I really enjoyed their '70s stuff as well. Um, but yeah, like I said, coming back around to this album, even though the album cover, I I don't know what it is. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna look at it real real quick. I think so, it's a so, combination of a of a tank and a lion. It's almost yeah. It's, well, it's like it's almost like some sort of panther or something like that that's wearing armor, riding a tank. It, 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 but it's it, I don't know. It's it's it baffles me to this day because it's it it just looks like a mess to me. It's but, reminiscent. It, it's kind of like if somebody looked at the album cover for Tarkus by Emerson, Lake, and Palmer <laughs> okay. while on acid, and that's what you would see. Look, look it up. Look it up. <laughs> Tar- Tarkus? Hold on. Yeah. How do you spell that? T-A-R-K-U-S. If, if somebody looked at that album cover while high on acid, that's what you would get. Oh, okay. holy shit. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that is, holy crap. That is weirdly similar. Yeah. When, when, I'm only now drawing this comparison. <laughs> holy crap. So that was 1971. Maybe, shit, maybe it's some sort of an homage to Tarkus. I mean, that's yeah. an equally bad album cover, but you know, <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> but I, but I, but I do think it's important to point out that like the, the, I sh- yeah, I don't really like the cover art of this album, but I don't give a shit. Cause musically that's what I was judging musically. The, the, <laughs> it, the, maybe it fits the album a little bit. Like it does feel like it's big, it's big and kind of, a um, watch the fuck out. Here we come kind of, kind of thing. And <laughs> there, there is a power to this album. But um, there really aren't any. This is one of the few albums I think from this time period where there's no big single, which yeah, is right. interesting to me. That I, they, I think I'm sure they released singles from the album, but um, I don't know what they were. It looks like "Free Will Burning" was a single, which that's fucking great. But um, even even though there aren't those big standout tracks, I feel like every song is kind of a standout. It's, I guess you could say the same thing about point of entry. If you take out heading out to the highway, but, um, so these albums could switch places for me. I really think these are both really good. And defenders of the faith is just when it comes to the Judas priest discography, I feel like it hits it right in the, that midpoint where they were, coming out of the seventies, going into the eighties. And I, I, I feel, I almost feel like this is the best representation of Judas priest. If somebody wanted to know what does Judas priest sound like? This is so much in the middle of what they did. Yeah. That it's perfect. It's like all the best elements of, of what they had to offer in a really f- cool metal album package. So, um, yeah, that's my, that's my number one. With a crazy acid nightmare on the front cover. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And a, and a killer ending. I love the ending of this album. It's just, I don't know, something is so, so it's, it's, it's something about leaving an album with sort of a fist in the air kind of quality as opposed to petering out or having some sort of long drawn out like 10 minute epic. It, it just feels like they came in and rocked your world and then got the fuck out with you still, still holding your fist high in the air. And hell yeah. Yeah. So defenders of the faith is my number one. God damn this. I can't believe we did it. (laughs) (laughs) It was an undertaking for me folks. And so now that I'm done, I would have to say that I still don't consider myself a Judas priest fan. Because I feel like that is cheapening actual fans. <laughs> because <laughs> I have so many gripes here and there about things that they did. But I have to admit that following their trajectory, like I said, up until Painkiller, um, I think that they did nothing but really good shit. Like they're like they they even the even the things that I didn't like about the first couple records. 
that's the beginning of a band and yeah. and hearing them take that journey from the 70s through the 80s up until when they decided to really go full balls out metal and painkiller it just it's a it's a it's a nice story and i feel like the story kind of gets soured by the albums following it and yeah. th- that's why i wouldn't consider myself a fan cuz i feel like i can't say that you know, I, I can't I can't say that about this band because there's a clear line that's drawn where I think they did great shit and then they just did pretty good shit. Although I do think Firepower is a great album, but um, but I can't deny that they are one of the biggest metal bands in the world. Um, and, and honestly, I think they earned it. Whether or not I feel like their intentions were pure, going more of the full on metal route. Um, they've earned the right to do whatever the fuck they want. And if that's what they want to do, and if people like it, then, uh, then who the fuck am I? <laughs> you know, <laughs> who am I? My opinion does not matter in your world at all. Um, but it was fun taking this journey. Oh, uh, I've, I've got a little thing here. Just, just in reference to the uh, Defenders of the Faith artwork. Okay. Uh, I totally forgot that there are like full on at least on screaming for vengeance and defenders of the faith there are like little s- sentences on the back that are like really dramatic lines from uh just describing the artwork on the front and here is the uh description i i guess okay <laughs> of of this album's mascot uh so here we go the cover art by doug johnson who also designed the hellion for screaming for vengeance depicts the metallion a (laughs) ram-horned yeah yeah here we go a ram-horned tiger-like land assault creature with gatling guns and tank tracks conceptualized by the band and the back cover contains a message saying this Rising from the darkness where hell hath no mercy and the screams for vengeance echo on forever. Hold on, hold on a second. You need to be turning up your British accent for this. It sounds like it would be way cooler if you did that. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do. Should I do the full on Vincent Price? Do like a, like a number of the beast kind of thing. Okay. Rising from the darkness where hell hath no mercy and the screams for vengeance echo on forever. Only those who keep the faith shall escape the wrath of the Metallion, master of all metal. Oh, man, that gave me chills. That, that, <laughs> why didn't they just have that at the beginning of the album and it kicks in with the, with the, with the free will burning? I know, um, that'd be so sick. <laughs> now that I've said that, I might just add that secretly to the album somewhere and secretly re-release it (laughs) i I do i do really want to know though because now now with that description especially with the but the the, what the band came up with i i would really like to know if everyone in the band thought it was good because (laughs) because because there's one thing there's one it's one thing when you come up with an idea of a fucking animal slash killing machine vehicle um but then when you see the artwork for it because I, if this had been if this had been presented to me, I would have been like, "Oh, all right, I, I guess." <laughs> I mean, it's got all the elements there, I guess, and uh, you know, it's maybe I'm being too harsh on it, but it's it's uh, that's what I do apparently. But it's do you do you want to hear the one for um, screaming for vengeance as well? Y- yes, I do. Okay, I'm gonna have to st- I'm gonna have to squint because it's rather small. <laughs> That's what she said. <laughs> From an unknown land and through distant skies came a winged warrior. Nothing remained sacred. No one was safe from the hellion as it uttered its battle cry, screaming for vengeance. Awesome. I I think I don't know if I've seen any like live footage from this era. But I would love to see if they had someone do that live. Because that uh, would have been then, so cool if they then, did. And then let me guess, you get to Turbo and it's like, place your hand upon my candy cane cock. 
From the sky it descended, the peppermint <laughs> cock. <laughs> oh man, uh, this is, this was fun. Awesome. Um, so, yeah. any any final thoughts from you on the, our whole Judas Priest journey? I'm proud of us that we pulled off a three parter. You know, I'm. Yeah. You know, generally speaking, we on average we're usually a, a two parter kind of thing, with the occasional one parter. But god damn, we pulled off a three parter. Yeah. And Very I and nice. I, luckily and I, I feel like maybe it's a three parter that people won't mind because you know it's and there's a lot to talk about. Oh, for sure, yeah. The the story of Judas Priest is is a is, a, is rich with material. It's uh there's a, there's definitely a lot to talk about. And uh yeah. And we did it. We it, talked about all of it. For sure. And you know, it's it's given me an insight into albums that i'd previously neglected which is awesome too yeah and it and it gives me the right to when i tell somebody i'm not a judas priest fan and they tell me well you just need to go listen to all their albums i'll be like i fucking <laughs> did that <laughs> check out my podcast at yeah, WWE. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or or don't if you don't want to be mad at me <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, this was fun. Um, if you guys have made it all the way through, like I said before about the beautiful people out there, if you literally have sat through all three of these episodes, um, and this one, which is now reaching two hours and 15 minutes or so, um, (laughs) we appreciate it because, um, you know, what, what is this all about? If we're just talking to each other, I guess, you know, it's a little bit therapeutic, but, um, but uh, yeah, so um, thank you very much for listening. I, I have a feeling we're going to come back next time with a one-parter just to clear, yeah. the, cl- clear the palette or whatever. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, thanks for listening. If you're listening to this on YouTube, like I always say, feel free to put all your comments down below and tell me you know, why you can't respect me anymore <laughs> or <laughs> how you want to know my credentials because you think I, 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 you know, I, there was a, a guy on one of my, my, uh, um, reaction videos that left all these comments and wanted to know, like, I just want to know what instruments you can play. And, uh, it's like, he wanted <laughs> me to validate my opinion. I'm like, dude, you are one motherfucker out there and I don't care. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I don't need to explain myself to you, but um, anyway, I think, I feel like a lot of people feel like, you know, I, I guess there are a lot of people out there who just talk out of their ass. Like they've been listening to metal for a couple of years and they feel like they have an opinion <laughs> on everything, but I've spent a lot of time with a lot of the music that we talk about and yeah, I know how to play music. Jeez. Um, <laughs> but anyway, for those of you who, uh, who enjoy my shit, uh, thank you. And, um, um, if you're listening to this as a podcast, head on over to YouTube and check out Eddie Sparks and check out old head and the videos that we've been putting out, new new Eddie Sparks video coming in the near future, which I'm excited about. Yeah, I've I've kind of stepped back for a while to really reevaluate, uh, you know, what what I both in, enjoy making and what people like. And I went through a bit of a grind phase where I was like trying to put out a video a week, and it just was not working for me because the the editing that goes into my Shit. stuff is, is is time consuming as fuck yeah i mean and even even me i do i do t- you know two videos a week and a podcast editing and and none of it is very special like yours is way more involved than mine and even then i'm just like oh this is this is a takes a lot of time up for me but um at the end it's 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 a lot of fun so um, I guess with, with to stop this this episode from getting even fucking longer, <laughs> um, I'm, we're going to go ahead and sign out. Um, thank you for for listening to Cranked and Ranked. We'll be back um, in a week. You think? We'll I'll, we'll see what happens. Cool. Um, and we'll be back with another band and more uh, of these ridiculous discussions that we have. So, uh, Mr. <laughs> Eddie Sparks, take us out. Later.